Welcome to Design Talk 14. This design talk is about an industrial lamp that I have re-engineered. It's based on a YouTube restoration video and reference material I found on the internet. I'm intrigued by the vintage design and the pronounced industrial look that it has. As far back as I can remember, I've found the industrial look to be very appealing, be it in fixtures or tools or in architectural design. Pictured here is an earlier industrial light that I modeled in TurboCAD and rendered in KeyShot. These two renders are among my favorites. I just love how the finish on the metal components turned out. As a side note, the red globe is not a result of turning the light on, although an area light has been added to the bulb, but because a ridges type of texture was applied on the glass in KeyShot. I came across this industrial lamp restoration video on YouTube by Old Things Never Die. At first I wasn't sure I liked it, but the more I delved into it, the more I came around to appreciate it. It definitely has some interesting shapes, and I thought that it'd be fun to model and to discuss here. As I watched the restoration video, I snagged numerous screen captures of the parts and assembly so I could try to understand the various interactions and ultimately help me to model them. Modeling based on visuals like this can be challenging when there's not much to help with determining size. The presenter's hands, though, give a clue, as does the bulb. Using this as a starting point, I figured out the sizes as best I could as I went along. I started working on this project beginning with the bulb. I found the elliptical bulb image on the left and checked out the size of a similar E40 size. I scaled the image to match the E40 base size and I found the bulb size to be about 3.5 inches in diameter and 8 and 3 8 inches tall. That corresponded to one of the standard sizes that are available for that type of bulb. As is often the case, I was grateful to Google for allowing me to find a Wikipedia page and other web pages with great detail about the Edison thread sizes. As I made progress modeling the parts, I went ahead and 3D printed them to check the fit. I did make some minor modifications just for fun and I was pleased with the results. I'd be curious to see if my modifications would pass electrical certification. As seen in the 3D print image above, I can see something that they'd question. Can you identify the issue? We'll talk about the issue when we review the model and drawings later on in this presentation. As is often the case, I decided that I'd be using SOLIDWORKS for this project. Simply put, it's a masterfully put together CAD program with so much to offer. I just love it. So let's move into SOLIDWORKS now and look at the industrial lamp in detail. So here we are in SOLIDWORKS. We've got the full assembly on screen. So I'll just orbit a little bit so we can have a quick peek at that. Like so. Then I'm going to change views to one I've established as exploded. So I'm selecting that now. So when this is exploded, it'll fill up this area here. So let's go ahead to the Configurations Manager. Let's look for the exploded view. And instead of doing an animation, I'm just going to double click this to explode it. There's so many parts in here that the animation goes so fast, it's barely worth watching. And that's because of the number of parts and the limitation on the time you can set. So if we have a quick peek at some of these parts, we'll see that there's quite a number of them. like so. Good, then I'm going to collapse this and then I'm going to go back to this feature tree and select front plane and let's just do a section view of that. Clicking OK and let's switch to front view. So I thought this is a pretty nice look. We can see everything so nicely detailed in there. Just like so. So we'll turn off the section view and switch back to isometric view. So at this point, I'd like to review two parts. I'd like to review the base of the bulb and the main body of this unit. With both, we'll do a build review to see how I went about modeling them. 
So let's go ahead and switch over to the light bulb, just like so. So it's actually pretty simple. It's only a few steps to get to that, but it was a little bit challenging figuring out these threads. So we're going to go ahead and roll this all the way to the top to show where I started out. And I actually started out by inserting an image of that bulb. And that helped me figure out what profiles I needed. So this image is inserted, but it's got a 50% transparency. So when you draw your sketch lines over here, you can see them still really well over this image. So I'm just going to go ahead and hide that. And we'll go to the initial revolve. So the initial revolve was based on this profile here, just like so. And then I created a plane just in this location here, just up from the bottom. And that's where I started my helix for the next steps to come. So that starts with a circle about the same size as this. And then the helix comes off of that. So now when we put a profile on here and we sweep cut it around here, it'll show us tapered down at the bottom here and then work its way up to the top. So we'll do that like so. And let's go ahead and look at that shape for the profile. And we'll go to front view to do so. So in order to get these rounded like this, this is the profile that I needed. It took a little while to figure it out and I actually got some help on the SolidWorks form. I was getting it, but I just couldn't quite figure it completely out and someone suggested this, so I was glad that I asked. So when that sweep cut goes up, it follows around at the pitch that's set and it stops at that location where desired. So next I added another plane up at the middle here where this ended and I added another helix and that helix is um, tapered outward so that it will also taper out as it's cutting through here so you'll see that in the next step so that's cut like that and because it keeps expanding out it tapers out and again that's the same profile that was used below I just moved a copy up here so next I added some fillets to round that out a little bit. You saw that happen, I think. And then another fillet down at the bottom to finish off here. And then another fillet, which was down at the bottom. And then next I did a shell of this unit. Just like so. It's pretty straightforward. And then I did a sketch at this location so that I could slice this bottom chunk off or split it off, which is what I did. Just like so, and I gave it a different color. So that'd be the insulation part of this. And next I did another revolve. Let's see where that is. That's the bulb actually up top. And that was a pretty straightforward sketch. Just like this. Hopefully you can see it well enough. So it's hollow and I didn't add any of the internal units or the internal parts of this bulb because I wasn't planning on having this clear. Next I did another revolve and that's just down here to create this contact. Just a simple sketch again. And then a little more filleting. That's just on the bottom there. And a little more filleting Where's that? Just at the top there on the outer edge. So that's that. Pretty straightforward. It went well. So let's go ahead and look at the main body. So I'll switch over to that one now. Just like so. So the main body was a lot more complex, as we can see by all of the steps required to create that. So let's go ahead and roll this all the way up to the top. And here in this, I went ahead and started with two images again. So let's just turn those on to have a look. So these weren't all both used exactly at the same time, but they were certainly used to reference off of. So one was this picture of the collar, <laughs> finding a reference one that was pretty much square on from the top. And this one was 
fairly nice in that it gave a, a pretty good look pretty much directly on from a side. So I'm going to turn these both off again. And the initial revolve, let's see what that looked like. So this was it, pretty straightforward. And that's what the sketch looked like. Next I did a fillet down at the bottom here. And then I did another boss extrusion just to create these units down here. I didn't see a purpose for these, but um, they certainly could have threaded holes for some other kind of attachment. Next was some more filleting. That's just on there, and then another fillet. Just around there, just like so. Another boss extrusion. So that was starting to create these little fins that come off of here. So that was just a sketch profile. It looked like that. And then a chamfer, which is just down here. And then I added a tapped hole through that unit. And then I threaded it with the thread tool. And then I circular patterned those. Set a four. And I did some more filleting. That's just in these corners like so. And next I created a plane. That's just down a little bit from the top here. And what did we do next? We created this unit over here. I think this is part of the hinging and we'll know shortly. And yes it is. So then I did a cut extrude just to create a bit of channel in here. I'm not exactly sure what that was for, but the one that I saw in the reference material had it, so I added it here. And then I went ahead and did a bit of filleting around here. I added some tapped holes, and then I threaded those as well. Just like so. Next I did a chamfer. That seems to be at the bottom here just like that. Next I created two axes or axes and um, I got them hidden right now. I'll just select them like this. So I put one here and one here so that I could change the work plane to be in line with these. So if we look at the plane we'll see where that is just like so. And that's so that I could start working on a rib down in this location. So I added a rib at that location and that was just a simple sketch that looked like this. Added some measurements so that it would end at a certain place here and then I farted around with it till I got it to look the way I liked it. Next I added a variable fillet on one of these edges and another one on this side. Now this looks a little bit wonky and that's because I tried to create some draft angle on this to thin out as it came out this direction. I don't think it worked very well and um, I just left it and I just decided we'd just use that as a discussion point. So you got to be really, really careful. There might have been a better way of doing that but I wasn't sure how to figure that out. Next I did another fillet. Where is that one? So that's around that rib. And then I did a circular pattern of that rib four times, just like so. Another axis somewhere. It looks like it's just in the middle and I must have figured I needed that for some reason, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. Probably to help with making this plane come off at another different angle like this to start the next ribs. For some reason, I couldn't create a rib at that location with this pattern. So what I ended up doing is I made a boss extrusion of a profile that looked like this. Just like that. So it takes a shape, but it also cuts out into here and goes right into this unit like so. So then I did a variable fillet on one edge and then a variable fillet on the other. 
Next I did a circular pattern like so. So that's these doubles. And then I needed to delete these faces in here, so I went ahead and did that, just like so. Next, some filleting. So that's around those. Next, another plane. Looks like it's over here, and I'm not sure what the reason was for that one just at this moment, but let's see. Should be this here. Yep. So this was to create this sketch over in this area like this. And then a cut extrude to create this little notch here. And then I need to delete this space, so I went ahead and did that, just like so. Now I wanted to have some draft angle on these as well. I wanted this face to tip inward. So I used the Move Face tool to do that, just like so. And then I went ahead and circular patterned that. So when you do delete faces, that typically doesn't work when you go ahead and include them in a circular pattern or even a mirror. So you end up having to do the other ones at another step. So I deleted those faces off of those units like that. And then I did three move faces to tilt those units inward, just like so. So I needed one more rib off of this unit here, so I went ahead and made that. The rib tool worked for me this time, which was good. Then I did a fillet around there and another fillet around the back of it. Then I did a circular pattern for the, that particular rib all the way around. Next, another fillet. So that's just back there. And then another fillet. Looks like it's up there. Another fillet on the front of those. Another fillet at the back here. And another fillet down around the bottom. And again, another fillet. Where is that one? Out here. One more fillet. And that's down here. Next, we needed another plane. I'm not sure what for, but it looks like it's over here. I think we're going to start working on the inside. So, boss extrusion to get that. Then I did a move face on that to tilt it in to get a bit of draft angle. And another plane. That's going to be the opposite side. I guess I couldn't mirror copy that. I don't know if I tried to do a um, circular pattern or not, but maybe I could have tried that. So again, same steps. Boss extrusion. Move the face. Now I did a fillet to do the edges of those units, like so. Next we have a cut extrude. That looks like it's going through this unit. And I made that horizontal through here. Even though these are have draft angle, I wanted to go straight through. Next, I added some chamfers, just here and here, both sides. Next, I added a threaded rod that I downloaded from McMaster Car, and it's basically a, a three-piece unit, which is fine. Next, I needed to do some combined features, in this case, subtraction. So I did one over here that created the threads in this unit. Then I did one over here to create the threads over here. And then the third one completed the bit of threading that was in both sides here, just to the inside. So that we ended up with threading through both, just like that. Next is a plane. So that plane's down at the bottom here. I guess I'm making the little bump up that's going to be in here for the socket itself or socket assembly. So I created that boss extrusion like this. And then I cut out the center of that like so. I added some tapped holes and some threads on both sides. Then I filleted the edges in there. Next was another boss extrusion. So that's down there. 
and a tapped hole and a thread and then a circular pattern next is some filleting there and there and wherever that was that's up top so that's just finishing up up there so next I added a tapped hole so that's down at the bottom here that's for the for the hanger and then added some threads in there another plane to do some more work somewhere and that is up here I'm not sure what for but we'll find out in the next step uh, so that was just down a little bit from this space so that I could add these things here so that was a boss extrusion another sketch that's a 3d sketch I think it was just to mark out where these ones were and then a boss extrusion and another what is that circular pattern to finish that off see these were different that's why I didn't do them as a circular pattern of the first one now some more filleting just around there and some more filleting up at the top like so next we needed some 1032 tap holes up top and then okay this is kind of weird in a sense so these are a 1032 hole and when you go to the threading tool in SolidWorks it doesn't have a 1032 so I did another combine a subtraction a boolean subtraction so I added this screw that I downloaded from McMaster car then I did the 3D subtraction. That gave me my threads in there as I desired. Then I did the same over here. Add a screw. Do the subtraction. Same over here. Add a screw. Do the subtraction. And that's it. Pretty sweet. So next we're going to switch over to the drawings and have a look at those. So here we are looking at the drawings. So this is a pretty long set. It's 46 pages. And I've decided to use size B for this. So this is drawing sheet one and that's my assembly drawing. As typical, I include a full ISO view, exploded view, and the bill of materials. Here we have a typical title block down here with design by, drawn by, the dates, Here's a note about dimensions and tolerance. Here's a note about confidentiality, drawing size, drawing name, scale, and whatnot. Next is my layout sheet. There I just use some full views of the various sides, tops, bottoms, ISO, whatever I need. Here I've included a section view because I liked the look of it. And the layout is typically just showing envelope sizes. Next sheet, number three, we start to look at the individual parts. So this is a really complex part, so I've actually used three separate sheets to do some dimensioning and whatnot. It's kind of complex in the fact that it's got draft angle, and so that always makes for a challenge. So here we also start to look at materials, and I've decided to go with cast iron. I don't know if that would be the case for this, but that's what I've chosen. As for finish, I'm using painted, and I've included a drawing at the end with some paint specs on it that we'll look at when we get there. So here we can see some typical views. Front, top, side, isometric. we got dimensions as needed. We've got hole callouts, all kinds of stuff. So if you're looking and you see that I've missed dimensions, I wouldn't be surprised. I just did a quick run through of these, and I often miss dimensions. Hopefully I'd catch them when I ran through this again in my review, or other team members would catch anything like that in team reviews. So this is just some of the dimensions, as you can see here. All callouts, I think I mentioned. Then sheet two is a copy of that with some different views. 
One of the things I wanted to mention is you can see that I have some views from the last sheet here. So when I'm creating the next sheets, I will select one and select copy. And then I'll right mouse click over the tab again and select paste. And it's going to ask me where I want that. And um, we'll just move it to the end for now so that we know it's an extra. Click OK. And then it shows up where you told it to go either next or at the end. And it's a copy of that. So if we go all the way back to this sheet here. That's what we were looking at. So I would take those, slide them over to the right or the left so that I could try to lay out the next ones, kind of keeping in mind what I've done with this. So there's the sheet two of this unit, and then the sheet three of this one, which is actually sheet five of the series. We're looking more at the ribs here specifically. So you can see that different things are highlighted in different drawings. Now having these on three sheets might be confusing, so if you have access to a large format printer, perhaps using a size D and adding all of these views would make it that much better. Next is sheet six. Here we're looking at the collar, so pretty typical views. Start to see some cross sections, things like that. And here I've got a little bit of a note for us to discuss. So question, how do you lay out your drawings? And what I'm asking there is, do you lay them out in the fashion that they were laid out in the bill of materials? Or do you put all of the major components first and then the lesser ones further along and perhaps uh, adding your fasteners to the last sheets? So what I do as I work through this is I take a capture of my bill of materials I detail which ones are standardized parts or um, COTS parts, which stands for commercial off the shelf. And then I just do a check mark as I work my way through. That way I'm sure that I don't miss anything. Next is sheet seven, it's the globe, so just some typical views. Here we're changing the material, so when you're copying and pasting, you have to keep an eye on on these types of things. It'll keep most of the data you want, but you can just change what you need to as you go. Next is sheet eight, and that's the grill. The grill is one of the parts I made a little bit of a tweak to. Uh, in the reference material, it came up a little bit higher than this, but I wanted it to match the globe a little bit closer, so I made a few changes to it. So here we have some of the standard views that we need lots of details and whatnot with regards to dimensions. Here, because I wanted to add a little bit more notes to describe materials, I just wrote as noted down here and added some notes here instead. So one of the things that I've done in here is I've measured off some of the center lines, um, but I did include you know, say something like this, you have three different dimensions off it so they can get whatever they need. So I'm asking a question of you here, do you find it acceptable to measure off center lines? Personally, I think it's fine as long as you're identifying what's happening in your drawing. The more information, the better is my opinion. Next sheet is the seal. So the seal's not a solid part as one would consider it. So it comes in liquid and it solidifies. So I did go ahead and add an image in here to illustrate what I'm talking about. So here's a smaller detail showing this is glue. And the glue is described as what it is. It's for joining glass to painted metal. And um, this just shows the final result. Here from the model, I was able to extract volume and surface area. So would you do this in your drawings? Would you include something that's not a solid part, basically? Um, I again think this is, this is good because it gives you an idea of what it's going to look like installed. And it's going to make sure that nobody forgets to include this while they're pricing things out. And for material, I wasn't exactly sure what to specify for it, but I know that in my past 
work life, we'd often make a call to 3M to see what they could suggest for something like this. They were always happy to help out, especially if we were going to buy a whole pot of it. So next sheet is the glazing. So I just copied and pasted the sheet again, moved these things over just to help me figure out how I wanted to lay this back out. I kept this from before, but I changed the hatch pattern on this one to illustrate the glazing. Here, just as a note, or a side note, this is just a cross section of this view, and I think it's okay to do that, to leave this view out of, out of the way. It's pretty straightforward. You don't really need to see this to know what this is about. So the glazing, again, is a, another off-the-shelf part. And I'd certainly be talking to a glass company who deals with this type of product to see what would ensure that this all stays in place. Next sheet is the nameplate. Now I actually did the nameplate in TurboCAD um, because SolidWorks is not able to bend something like this. It doesn't like these multiple layers or levels. So I know that from the past I had issues, so I just went ahead and made this in TurboCAD. Now I certainly could have made the flat pattern in SolidWorks and then just imported one of these curved ones from TurboCAD, but it worked just as well doing both right out of TurboCAD. Maybe in later versions of SolidWorks they've fixed that, but I know back up to SolidWorks 2019 we couldn't do this type of thing, which was really too bad. So in here we've got a lot of baseline dimensions to help determine where all of this stuff goes. Down in the notes we talk about what the font is. And here we're asking for a finish in here. But here in the notes we mentioned to look at the finish drawing for those paint specs as well. Next sheet is the gasket. It goes between the main body and the collar. It's very straightforward and I'm asking for neoprene rubber for that. Next is the support that goes on to the bottom of the main body inside and holds up the socket assembly. So again, pretty straightforward. This is made with sheet metal so that we can make a flat pattern in there to detail that and then some cross sections and whatnot. Material and material hardness, stuff like that. Here I also wanted to mention, and maybe you saw it before that, but specifically here, we're starting to see where I'm showing some metric and some imperial combined. A lot of the electrical parts that I found uh, with regards to the lamp were metric, but I really wanted the industrial lamp to continue to be imperial. So whenever I had some mix of those, I try to include dual dimensions. I think that's also acceptable in things. I know my British friends would sure like it if I worked only in metric, but I got confused again when I worked so much in the US, and they typically still use Imperial. So next is the reflector. Pretty straightforward again, just some typical views. This is going to be aluminum plate that's press formed into shape. Next is a porcelain lamp holder. Now I looked on online for ones you could buy off the shelf, standardized parts, and I didn't see anything that looked like this. So I'm assuming the one that was used in the lamp was specifically designed for that one. So I went ahead and, and kept that design. Now if I was re-engineering this for actual manufacture, I'd probably try to find something that could work off the shelf. There's lots of stuff available out there, that's for sure. As I looked, it was obvious that was the case. So this is going to be porcelain, and it's going to have a gloss glazing on it. Here I'm talking about how I want them packed. I wanted to be able to mention that to the viewers that, you know, when you're making your drawings, you can specify everything you want about it. Here we're saying supply in boxes of 50, each separated by cardboard dividers. That, of course, is to ensure they don't get broken. Next is the lamp holder. So on this one, I didn't specifically dimension the threads. I don't know if I have them 100% and I didn't want any confusion. So I just put what the thread is called, uh, and then Edison thread. And I would order this from a vendor who makes these types of things, so they would already have all that detail down pat. Of course, I'd ask for some samples up front when the 
started to produce these just to ensure that they fit with the bulbs that we could buy in this location. So next is the tie down that gets used with that. Here we've got some typical views, all the various dimensions and hole callouts. And in the beginning I had mentioned a little bit of an issue that I saw and I want to talk about that here. So if we go ahead and look at this image here, the tie down is, is over on this side. This is the other side that uses this connector along with this spring and this seat here. So the thing of it is, is if you strip your wires to attach here, I have it so that they come in this end, both sides actually. So if you strip your wires too long and you stick them through, you have bare wire coming in this area and although their chance is slim, somehow if it's too long it could be bent up and it could touch the other part which is connected to something else. So then you'd short out. So my thinking was I should have maybe made these a little bit longer and had the hole through the side. So even if your stripping of your wire was longer than this, it could stick out this way and it still wouldn't really get a chance to touch the other connector. So that's probably why in the original unit that's how they had them designed. I wanted to make some tweaks just for fun, but as you can see, you really have to think your tweaks out well, otherwise you could create problems that you didn't have with the initial design. Anyway, so that's that. So the next part is the opposite side, and that's what we were looking at here. The other one was back here. And again, it's the connector, and this one has got a bit of a seat here for a spring. And then next, there's the topper that goes on top of that spring to make that whole little bit of an assembly. As for the spring, I downloaded that from McMaster's car. It's a standardized part that could be utilized for sure. And next is the ground block. So I changed this a little bit too. In um, the original design, there was that central block business and it had a bit of an L shape on it that you could tie your ground to. I decided to add those four little raised bosses around the bottom so you could stick this on one of those and then use it as needed and then you'd put your ground wire through here and tighten it onto that. Hope that makes sense without us actually going back and looking. Next is the eye screw, so that's a part we'd have to have manufactured and it's just going to be zinc plated steel and this will act as our hinge between the collar and the main body. Next is the hinge pin in the same location and we're going to use E-clips to hold that in place so that describes what's required there. Next is the lift ring and here I can see I forgot to change the title down here so that's an error that I'd have to catch hopefully. And the lift ring, I don't know if this is something we can find off the shelf because of its unique size and I wanted it to be able to hinge so you get your screw down in through here without any issue. So again, just some typical views, cross sections, hole callouts, materials and whatnot. Right next is this unit here. This is a big collar, a big honking thing. Do um, you remember those faces that um, had that little notch at the top. This is to slide in there to keep this from rotating as you tighten the big nut into there. So I found this to be really overkill it seemed to me. It seemed like there was so many bulky big pieces there and they just didn't seem to serve any purpose. So there was the inside and then the outside part. So again I just copied and pasted that sheet moved these over here and then tried to dimension these to look similar to that side. Here we're die cast aluminum again and we're just going to use black paint on these. There's a sleeve bolt so this looks like a part that would also have to be manufactured so that's pretty straightforward. 
and a cord bushing that fit into there. Again, a different material. Here we're looking at EPDM rubber. Then it had the cord restraint in there. So I didn't know if this was something we could find as a COTS part. It sure seems like we might be able to, but the size was such that it may be not quite available. Anyway, for this sheet and the next two, I added this view and highlighted which one we're talking about. So it's just some typical views, whole call out, things like that. So this is the threaded side. This is the side with the clearance holes. And then these are the specific screws for this one. Next is the bulb, and that's of course a standardized part. So I'm just detailing down here what we're looking for. And next is the wiring. So in the last design talk, I talked about how I lay out the wiring, the drawings, in three different ways or combinations thereof. This one was simple enough to lay out straight like this, detailing how I wanted the ends stripped. And then, of course, the details about that. I snag these details from McMaster Car, which is always handy for that type of thing. So the last few are just simple standardized parts. Again, I downloaded the models from McMaster Car and utilized them in here. So another screw, another screw, another set screw here for the other end of the wiring outlets. And then here's some, what do we call those, drive screws for the nameplate. Here's another socket screw. Here's our E-clip. Here's what they call a hex thread adapter. So this is screwed into the base, and then this raises up a bit. And then on this top part would be the reflector, so it's raised up a little bit into the location that's desired. Another screw, still another screw. Here's a hex bolt. And one more pan head screw. And then the last one is the finish. So here I put some rendered images on here. And I detailed this as much as I thought needed to be. So I specify exactly what paint we want, what color we want, and that type of thing. So hopefully that would be enough detail for our vendors to complete these parts. So that's the design in a nutshell and the thoughts and the motivations behind it. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that it will give you some things to think about while designing and modeling your own products. If you'd like to see some TurboCAD tips for free, visit Don Check's TurboCAD Tips page. If you're interested in delving deeper into TurboCAD learning, be sure to check out the full project tutorials on my Textual Creations shopping page. See you next time.